Welcome to this linear algebra lecture series. In this lecture, we will be discussing the notion of a field. And uh, this is a very important concept in linear algebra. Uh, but before I get into that, let me just uh, say a few words uh, about abstraction. So the definition of a field is going to be very abstract and more than likely that this is your first brush against higher mathematics, which by which I mean undergraduate level mathematics. And once you look at this very abstract definition, unless you are part of some math undergraduate program, this might just make you feel like uh, math is very, very boring because it might not mean anything to you as to what is going on. But I encourage you to sit tight for at least a few lectures and you'll see the point of uh, these abstractions. Ultimately, they serve concrete examples. Abstractions are meant to meant for us to be able to handle concrete examples in a robust manner. And at the end, of, at the end of this lecture, we will see concrete examples. So, even at first, if this feels completely un, you know, completely incomprehensible, uh, please don't be deterred by that. All right. So. Uh, I'm assuming that you're familiar with the language of sets and functions. And with that preamble, let me begin. So a field is a triple where this guy is a set. This denotes a really a function which consumes a pair of elements of f and produces an element of f. And this dot also denotes a function which consumes a pair of elements of f and produces an element of f. Uh, the first one we call addition, but do not confuse this with the addition of real numbers or rational numbers that we are familiar with from high school. This is a very abstract addition. Basically, it mimics the properties of addition that we learn in high school and similarly uh, the, the multiplication. So, fine, uh, these are just names and before I get into this such that. So yeah, so a field is a triple where f is a set, this is a function, this is a function of this sort, such that cert certain things happen. But before I get into that, uh, <clears throat> instead of writing plus alpha comma beta, where alpha and beta are elements of f, so plus alpha comma beta is the image of alpha comma beta under this function we write, instead of writing plus alpha comma beta, we just write alpha plus beta. Again, this plus has nothing to do with real numbers. Alpha and beta are not necessarily real numbers anyway. Right? And similarly, instead of writing dot alpha comma beta, we write alpha dot beta or simply as alpha beta. We don't even write the dot. Great. So such that what happens? So I'm going to get into that, this such that. So such that bunch of properties are satisfied. So the first property is associativity, which says what? It says that alpha plus beta plus gamma equals alpha plus beta plus gamma. This is for all alpha, beta, gamma and I'll explain further what that means, but let me finish this. And the third is that alpha dot beta dot gamma equals alpha dot beta dot gamma. So, of course, these are for all alpha, beta and gamma in F. Okay, and uh, let me just say what this, this thing means. This means really formally this is plus alpha comma plus beta comma gamma and this already <laughs> uh, convinces us as to why this is a very horrible notation. This is much more natural. So instead of writing that, which no, no human can make sense of, we write this. This bracket just denotes first you do that and then you do that. So that's like just in high school. All right. So the other is commutativity. And note that this property of associativity holds for real numbers. So if alpha, beta, gamma were real numbers, then this, this happens. So it's not something very, very 
out there. This is something in the familiar territory anyway. So what does commutativity say? Commutativity says that alpha plus beta equals beta plus alpha and alpha dot beta equals beta dot alpha. Again, this is for all alpha beta in F. So this is also familiar from real numbers. This is how addition in real numbers also behaves and same for multiplication. All right, the third property is additive and addition and additive and multiplicative identity. So we insist that there exists an element which we denote by zero, and this may get further confusing. Zero by zero, I don't mean the real number zero, just just a symbol zero which is there in F, such that. such that uh, alpha plus zero equals alpha for all the elements of f. So it behaves like zero, our familiar zero. And similarly, we insist that there exists another symbol which we write as one, such that one dot alpha is alpha for all alpha. Okay, uh, fourth property is addition, existence of additive and multiplicative inverses. So that says that for all alpha in F, there exists beta in F such that alpha plus beta equals zero. And before I say that, one can easily verify that this guy is actually unique. So even though this additive identity says that there exists such a zero, but one can easily show that there is only one such element. Because if we had more than one such element, suppose zero and zero prime were two elements in F with the property that alpha plus zero equals alpha for all alpha and alpha plus zero prime equals alpha for all alpha then by by the same logic 0 plus 0 prime would be 0 but 0 plus 0 prime by commutativity is also 0 prime 0 prime plus 0 which is 0 but now we use the the fact that this is uh, the this is behaving as the additive identity identity the first one so that gives us that this is actually 0 prime equals 0. So all I'm saying is that this additive identity is unique. There is one and there is only one such element in F which behaves this way. And same for the multiplicative identity, you can argue similarly. So when I write that alpha plus beta is equal to 0, it is, it is unambiguous. So for each alpha in F, there is beta in F, such that alpha plus beta is the additive identity of, the, of, of this F. Okay, and similarly, we insist that for all alpha in F which are non-zero, there exists beta in F, or let me write gamma in F, such that alpha gamma is one, which is one by one, we mean the multiplicative identity, which we can argue is unique. Okay, so, <clears throat> Instead of writing, you know, so this guy is called multiplicative inverse. And again, one can argue that it is unique. Even though here you only have an existential quantifier, one can argue that it is unique by a similar kind of reasoning. And this you can also argue is unique. So this thing is written as minus alpha. This is just a notation. And this thing is written as either alpha inverse or one upon alpha. Yeah, I think these are the two notations. And again, these are all very, very familiar for real numbers. We are just abstracting that those things out. Okay, lastly, we have distributivity. That is the, the addition and this multiplication, they, they, are, they gel with each other well. So for all alpha, beta, gamma in F, we have alpha dot beta plus gamma is alpha dot beta 
plus alpha dot gamma. Okay. So these five properties must be satisfied. And if that happens, then we call it a field. So you can have some set and some function like this and some other function like this, which, which could be completely arbitrary, then this won't be a field. But if you choose these functions in such a manner that all these five properties are satisfied, then we'll call that we have a field. Okay, and the only way to understand such abstract definitions is through examples. So let us uh, start with the most familiar field, which is the field of real numbers. So let R be the set of all real, real numbers. So I'm only assuming high school level of familiarity with real numbers, nothing more than that. Plus be the usual addition. and dot be the usual multiplication. Then this is a field. You could say the the axioms of a field that we just described actually just abstract out the relevant properties which we observe in real numbers. So no wonder this is a field. Okay, similarly, or not similarly, but another example is the field of complex numbers. So here C be the set of all complex numbers plus usual addition of complex numbers and dot the usual multiplication of complex numbers is a field. So maybe I should write this thing. This is set of all complex numbers. So you can verify this if uh, you don't immediately see it. And it is, I very much encourage you to do that. Okay, rational numbers, another very interesting field. So here, this is the, this, this symbol Q with, with, with a little bit of a cut denotes the set of all rational numbers. Again, plus is the usual addition of rational numbers and dot is the usual multiplication of rational numbers. So this is also a field. All right, uh, another example, which we will not go into any detail is finite fields. If you know about them, great. If you don't, then also great, because we won't be using or we won't be instantiating any of our theorems in the setting of finite fields. But all the theorems uh, that I will prove will be proved in full generality as far as possible. Sometimes you cannot, you cannot prove it for uh, fields other than real and complex numbers. So those theorems, well, of course, one cannot generalize. But if a theorem holds for arbitrary fields, I will state it for arbitrary fields and prove it that way. So, so anyway, my point is if you don't know about finite fields, it doesn't matter. You can ignore this. Okay, and let us see a non-example. So a non-example is uh, integers. So recall that in what are integers? Integers are these things. These things are integers. And uh, we denote it by this symbol Z with a with a extra slash. And Z with usual multiplication, usual addition and multiplication is not a field. Okay. 
Why is that? Because two is in Z is an integer, but two does not have a multiplicative inverse. does not have a multiplicative inverse in Z which is what am I saying I'm saying that there is no integer n such that 2n equals the multiplicative identity of Z but the multiplicative identity of Z is 1 multiplicative identity of Z is that integer which if you multiply any integer with you get the same integer back so clearly 1 dot n is n for all n and 1 is the only such integer of course we, we we already know that it's going to be unique by our previous discussion. So there is no integer n such that 2n equals 1, as one can easily see. So 2 does not have a multiplicative identity, so the axiom of multiplicative identity fails, and therefore integers do not form a field. They found something called a ring, but we don't want to get into that. Okay, so I guess this is enough for a first lecture, a lot of definitions, uh, but uh, one should keep my keep in mind the examples. These three fields will be the most important. If you know about them, great. Otherwise, forget about it. And that's the that's the end of this lecture. So as as usual, like, comment, share, subscribe. I also have Patreon. The link is in the description below. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.